welcome you again to this class concerning, uh, at this point, study of Adam. And following that, uh, we'll have a study of Abraham. I want to continue with going through the text uh, regarding Adam. And we had gotten last week to the first home that God gave Adam. And I'll repeat myself some, but you remember he planted a garden, a garden eastward in Eden. And the scripture says there he put the man whom he had formed, Genesis 2.8. And even in Eden, God didn't intend for man to do nothing. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Chapter 2, verse 15. Then, you see the really quite amazing, wonderful provisions that God made for Adam and Eve. And the fruit of the trees, they were sustained. They were able to eat the tree of life, and thus they would not die. And it's very interesting, I'd like to know more about it, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were not to eat of it. They were forbidden to eat of it. There's a reason for that. What did they need? Well, I think that it's a divine, positive divine law, that is, it's right on because God said, don't do it. But it trains them in their character, their moral character was being challenged right here. I guess that's a word for it. That much we had studied last week before we left uh, and time ran out. I'd like to continue with that, keeping in mind those points. In the care of the garden, we may not think of this this much, but there would be a certain amount of physical exercise and yes, even mental exercise. May not realize it, but when Adam named every animal, that was a mental exercise for him. And when he has to go about thinking uh, of what I was involved in dressing the garden, uh, and whatever she would do as his suitable help involved planning, involved doing things decently and in order. So it's obvious that they were expected to use the minds God had given them to do the work he had assigned to them. But of course, there was only one commandment that really tried their faith in God, and that was don't eat the forbidden tree. So in exercising dominion over all the earth, that would take some part of their thinking and their action. I don't know what all was involved because I can't conceive a place where there's no sin nor the consequences of sin. But these two are adults, but they have no sin. And I've never known an adult like that as far as a normal human being. But they were as normal as you could be. They were perfect, complete for what God made them to be. There's no sin. No, nothing's entered in like that. Yet there's something to do. They're to dress the garden, they're to keep it, they're to exercise dominion over all the earth. And thus, they were given these particular assignments, and they would be able then to exercise their minds in meeting the challenge and in developing them. I'll draw attention to a little later on in Genesis now. When God gave the guidelines, gave the pattern, gave the way that he would save Noah and his family from the flood. There are a lot of things that Noah was free to do. Uh, where would he go find the wood? How would he cut the wood? All of these different things he was allowed to think about. Remembering there'd never been any kind of boat like this made. Well, Adam was given that too. There would have been some problem solving involved in exercising dominion over all the earth and dressing the garden. 
Don't understand all of that because there's no sin there. There's no consequences of sin. They're in perfect fellowship with God. And thus there would be, of course, perfect love and companionship, which none of us living have ever known and nobody since that time has ever known as far as moral were concerned. So there could be in this state in physical bodies as they address the garden and exercise dominion over all, all that uh, animals, a wonderful, marvelous, great relationship with God. We look at verse 28 of chapter 1, and we see that God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And notice, and subdue it. That's interesting. Fruitful. Well, by the law of procreation, they would have children. Multiply. Somebody's got to uh, make more children. Just to put it bluntly, more human beings. Done by the law of procreation. And thereby the earth would be replenished. And, of course, there is, then again, subduing of it. I don't know whether that's a part of exercising dominion over everything or not. But again, notice how much action and the thinking that there is before there ever was seen in the world. So there had to be a lot of that kind of thing done. Wish I knew more about it, but I don't. But that's the text. And I might pause here and interject this. Whatever you do in seeking help to understand the Bible, the first place is to know the text. You don't know the text, you don't have anything to work with. It's like asking for a drink of water, and somebody gives you a marvelous container for the water, but there's not any water. So the greatest thing you can ever do as far as the first step in understanding the Bible is be exceedingly familiar with the text and whatever that requires. Most of the time, uh, when we think of studying the Bible, we think of reading it regularly every day. Well, I believe in that. I believe we ought to do it. We have to familiarize ourselves with the text, but there's so much more involved in studying the Bible than simply reading it. Reading's involved. You can't study without reading. I assure you, you can read it without studying it. Okay, now let's look at man's transgression. Remember, Genesis means origins. Genesis means beginnings, and here is the beginning of sin. You know, if you're studying with people, trying to convert them to Christ, uh, you need to be in this place to begin with. Uh, if you're going to begin with them, then begin with the beginning. God made a wonderful place for man. I hope we've said enough about the text or noticed the text to get that out. But then there's another being, the devil. There's no way for us to grasp how intensely angry, full of wrath and mad madness he has against God. And some way or the other, somehow or the other, he fully intended to thwart the plans and purposes of God. There's a lot I'd like to know about him. But I know enough about him to say I don't want his influence over me in any form or fashion. I think we can safely say that Satan existed before Adam did. Satan was, well, we can say he is, a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's the source of everything that's wrong and against God. Now, he knows what a man is. He's made in the image of God. He knows the appetites of the flesh. And he knows how to get man to transgress God's law. And he knows that's all he needs to do to break the whole thing down to destroy all the peace 
all the harmony that existed before sin was in the Garden of Eden and to destroy the fellowship between man made in the image of God and his God. So he desired to inject sin and death. When you think of sin, you must think of what God said, verse John 3 and verse 4 through the Holy Spirit, that sin is the transgression of the law. So Satan knows that I've got to get man to break God's law. There was only that one law that was right for one reason only, because God said so. Can't eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that became, in this pure positive law, that which truly put Eve and Adam's faith in God to the test. Did he mean what he said? Did he say what he meant? Well, we understand then that uh, Satan knows this is going to separate man spiritually from God and will cause him to begin to die. Satan knows all about that. And so he wants to get man to sin. Well, man still had the appetites of the flesh that we all have. And thus, as Paul wrote later on, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. Again, studying with people, trying to convert them. Here's where you begin to point that out. Before there's any problem with denominational doctrine that you've got to mess with and deal with, or there's any bigoted ideas come to mind because you're dealing with my sweet grandma's favorite doctrine or something, you simply point out to them that he wanted to get them to sin, period. Transgression of God's law. That's all he has to do. But he had a method. And we see that method here, and it has not changed. And that's the point I would make here in the study of somebody who I'm trying to convert. What was his method? Well, he didn't approach Adam, who is the head of the human race. And there are only two people on the earth, Adam and Eve. He wants to reach the head of the human race. Doesn't do it directly, does he? And what he does is approach the one God made to be Adam's suitable help. And he approaches her to deceive her, to deceive somebody, to tell somebody a falsehood, and yet get them to believe to be the truth. And that's what Satan was up to. And this led her to break God's law. And she then gave it to Adam. And he partook of it, and thus sin entered into the world. Now, it's interesting that Paul referred to this back over in the New Testament. When he said in uh, verse 13 of 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. I've found brethren that probably read that no matter how many times, as well as the text in Genesis, and they don't know that. Adam wasn't deceived. How do I know that? Well, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Well, the Bible tells me so. Well, it couldn't be plain. Adam was not deceived, true or false. So the devil didn't approach Adam directly, though he's the head of the human race, and that's who he's after. But he used his Eve. She's deceived. She believed the lie. She obeyed the lie. And then she gave to her husband, and he did eat. As the old preacher used to say, he went into the matter with his eyes wide open. He just took what she gave him. So when Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 
that's a very interesting statement that uh, we read a lot of times, never stop and think, what does that imply? Along with what is said in Genesis. So the devil's successful in carrying out his plan. As I said earlier, he, uh, he doesn't change it. He doesn't even change his method, methodology when it comes to trying to get Jesus to sin. Still uh, tries to get Jesus to violate God's will through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He doesn't change. Why should he change? Change. He gets everybody to sin. All is sin. I'm sure of the glory of God, Romans 3, 24. So we all have been separated from God because of sin that we committed. Going back to Genesis, we'll go through this again. Notice he approaches the woman. Seems to be that she was alone. Notice how he approaches her. He raises what I consider to be a powerful and insinuating question. And she, she listens to him. And he listens to her, by the way. I don't know that we notice that sometimes reading the text that, that she responds and he listens. Then he moves to remove her fear. Because she quotes back to him exactly what God told him they should not do. And then he says, uh, God's not telling you all you ought to know on this. He, there's a great reward for you. When you look at this, what you're seeing is the way he approaches everybody. Through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. Or lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That gets us thinking about it. And what starts in the mind and we meditate on it, as James points out, it germinates and it grows, and finally we break God's law. That's what Eve did. I don't know how to think about what Adam was doing at this time. It sounds about like somebody sitting in his easy chair watching Super Bowl and doesn't want to be bothered when his wife brings him supper in. He just gobbles it down and goes on. The woman took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, chapter 3 and verse 6. Now, I don't know all that this means, but it says, then their eyes were open. They became aware because of their sin. They knew they were naked. They attempted to cover their shame. There wasn't anything like this in the world before we sinned. No shame or anything like that. They made themselves these big leaf aprons. Which shows also when it's left the man to do anything he thinks is sufficient. It turned out that wasn't enough, so God had to clothe them properly. But notice that they did, before they were clothed properly, they, they hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Well, I don't know how that worked because it's, things were so different then. But nevertheless, fear is developed. Shame is developed. They don't want to be around God when they had been with him in full fellowship. And now they're hiding from him. Does that sound like people who know they're in sin today or who hear the truth and they don't love it? Well, certainly. People have always done that. But then God comes to Adam and Eve. I've always found this interesting. All of this is done for Adam and Eve's benefits, not done for God's benefits, since he's omniscient, knowing all that's the object of knowledge. He poses this question, where art thou? Now, for anybody looking for a sermon outline or something, you can take this one and turn it to a great sermon by just simply saying, uh, where art thou? And meaning spiritually with God, in your relationship to God, where are you? 
And you can ask yourself that. Where am I right now when it comes to God? Then God asked them, who told you that you were naked? And then he says, hast thou eaten of that particular tree? All of this was done so that they would think about what they knew they had already done, and that was break God's law. Thus demonstrating lack of love on their part for God, lack of faith in God and that one law. It showed, uh, frankly, that we don't know that God really knows how to take care of us or not. Of course, we all heard this talk about it. Adam blamed the woman. And uh, then, of course, that reflected on God because God gave him the woman. Notice how all of this has changed from what it was when he first awakened. And there was Eve made from a rib in his side. Totally different situation. It says, now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman because you was taken out of man. But now look at the attitude. Not one of gratefulness. It's, it's, it's blaming, placing blame where it didn't belong. And that's an important point to keep in mind. Of course, the woman blamed the serpent. Serpent was involved. Somebody might be asking, what was the serpent like? I don't know. Wasn't like any serpent I've ever seen. But God, you must remember that the serpent was, was uh, cursed. Or whatever he was like before God cursed him, it didn't seem to surprise the woman that she could carry on an intelligent conversation with him. It didn't surprise her that he would speak as he spoke. So God condemns the serpent. And we're going to have to end here in just a minute, but he made... Um, God did, made the first great messianic promise, chapter 3 and verse 15. After hearing J.D.'s study of uh, Messiah, the Jews knew full well what this meant, if they wanted to know. But like the kingdom and like their reason for existing and like their twisted view of the law of Moses, then they didn't get that either, so they didn't recognize Christ. Oh, I might mention here, since we had that good lesson, uh, you'll notice that Paul many times refers to Jesus as Christ Jesus. Christus, Jesus, anointed Savior, which means God's full approval that he's saved, anointed Savior. And, Christ, and Paul does that all the time. Christ Jesus, our Lord. So God condemned the woman in spite of her punishment. That raises questions. We understand the involvement of pain and so forth from a woman having a child now. Well, what would it have been like, since that's a curse upon her, as punishment for her sin, what would it have been like if they had remained in the garden? They received the command be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth before there was ever sin. And now you've got this. Well, I don't know. All I know is that it's punishment. Punishment for her being deceived. And then God condemned, uh, condemned the man and spake of his punishment. And by this transgression of Adam, sin and death made their entrance into the world, which God had made for them. And Paul refers to that back over in Romans 5 and verse 12. I think we read this last week, but I'll read it again in Romans 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Why? For that all have sinned. We are within a couple of minutes of this, I, I'll try to get into this next part. I'll have to quit. Uh, I will mention that when we get through the text of this, and that won't be too long, I'm going to spend the remainder of this. We'll follow the same format, Dean Abraham, uh, by noticing all sorts of lessons that we can glean from what we're studying here now. But very quickly, uh, we've already noticed uh, earlier on that uh, Adam is a type of Christ. Remember, we read last week Romans 5, 14, 
Uh, he says, Adam, who the figure of him that was to come. Well, that word figure comes from tupos, which is the Greek word for time. Then we noticed again from 1 Corinthians 15, 45, that Paul said the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a, a life-giving or a living spirit. And then he further says, the first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is of heaven. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heaven. So Christ's anti-typical relationship to Adam involves both likenesses and contrast. And we won't try to get into that now, but we're just about at the end of the thing. So next week, what I want to do, if the Lord wills, is to get into lessons to be learned. We'll spend a lot more time on that than we have on, on the text, but you might go back through and read these things that we started last week and think more about this, and then we'll look at the lessons to be learned. But before we leave our class, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll close the class out. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we can be together to enjoy the devotional period and the lessons we've learned and to study together from thy word. May it help us to be fortified that we might fortify the faith. Give us a good night of rest. Whatever time we have remaining on earth, may we be faithful in all things and fervent in our love for thee and thy cause. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.